Look at that. <clears throat> so I have a, a entitled message tonight, uh, The Calm Before the Storm. And hopefully in the course of our study, uh, we'll understand why. But please turn with me in your Bibles to Exodus chapter 6. And uh, as we start, let's do a quick recap of what happened in Exodus so far. It started with the Israelites multiplying in Egypt. And Pharaoh didn't like this, so he enslaves the Hebrews, forcing them to work for him. This doesn't seem to keep the Hebrews from multiplying, so he decides to kill all the baby boys. It is in the midst of this that Moses is born and escapes Pharaoh's murderous campaign and is adopted by Pharaoh's daughter. Fast forward 40 years, and Moses sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, so he kills the Egyptian. And when Pharaoh finds out about this, he wants to kill Moses, and so Moses flees to Midian, where he gets married and stays in the wilderness for 40 years. God then appears to Moses in a burning bush and commands him to go back and tell Pharaoh to let the Israelites go. To prove that it is indeed God that had sent Moses, uh, God gives him three wonders to perform. If you're wondering why three, by the mouth of two and three witnesses, may every fact be confirmed. However, Moses still does not want to go, so uh, God says, it's okay, Aaron is going to come with you and he'll talk for you. Then, coming to last week's sermon, Moses and Aaron then go to Pharaoh and tell him that God says to let his people go. Pharaoh, however, takes exception to this and then tells his taskmasters to make the work much, much harder for the Israelites. The Israelites then blame Moses for their increased misfortune and refuse to listen to him anymore. God then reassures the people of Israel that he will mightily bring them out of slavery, but they still don't listen. And with this, we are now in Exodus 6, verse 10. Tonight, we'll cover from here up till Exodus 7, 13. Uh, after 7, 13, we're starting in 7, 14, we come into the plagues. And just to give you a brief overview of uh, what it is that we're going to be going through, um, I just want to uh, briefly give you an outline of what we're going to study. Uh, in verse 10, we see God again tells Moses and Aaron to go to Pharaoh. Then we have a genealogy after which the Bible repeats the command to go to Pharaoh. Then in chapter 7, we see God again describe how he will deliver the Israelites with power. And then in chapter 7, verse 8 to 13, we see Moses and Aaron stand before Pharaoh again. Now, if you're like me, uh, you have some questions. The first question that comes to mind is why is there so much repeating going on? I've got this little outline and the colors are when the passages are very much alike. <clears throat> God says he will deliver the Israelites. Then he tells Moses to go. Then he again tells Moses to go. Then he again says how he's going to deliver the Israelites. It's like why it's still repeating. The second question is what's with the genealogy? Aren't we in the middle of something? We were just talking about Moses goes to Pharaoh and then we get a page out of the Hebrew phone book. Why is that? So the answer is that this genealogy in Exodus 6, 14 to 27 is a pivotal point in the book. The focus before and after this part is, is different. And if we, look, if we don't look carefully, we'll, we'll miss this. I mention this now before we begin reading the text so that you'll be on the lookout for it and so that when we study it together, you'll see it. <coughs> also, I hope you will understand that the Bible is not a jumble of disjointed pieces that were sewn together much later. Um, rather, it is a cohesive whole with everything in its proper place. Nothing is random, nothing is mistaken. I mention this because there are some people this day, these days that say exactly that. They say the Bible is a collection of random accounts that were, was put together a long time after these things happened. But this is not the case. Every word matters. Every sentence matters. Every paragraph is exactly where it needs to be. Third, in light of this, understand that we need to have some context uh, before we delve into the text. And we need to keep this in mind for the whole book of Exodus. So what is the context? <clears throat> so I'm going to discuss three layers of context that are relevant to our text tonight. It's kind of my introduction. The first is, uh, remember 
the, the, the larger context of the book of Exodus. The, the big thing. This is really the context of the whole Bible. And this is... God is the God who saves. He is the God of salvation. With might and power and wonders, He delivers His people. Like God says in Exodus 6, verse 6, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgment. Another broad context for the book of Exodus, and again for the whole Bible, is that God is the God who speaks. This is an incredibly important thing to understand. Once you pay attention, you will take note of all the places where this comes up in the Bible. That God is the God who speaks. He is the God who makes Himself known. The way God creates the world is by speaking, by making His will known. Exodus 6 verse 7, for example, um, if we consider the book of Exodus, uh, God says, You shall know that I am the Lord your God. And we'll continue to see this theme throughout the whole book of Exodus, that God makes Himself known. And not just to Israel. This is important. He doesn't just make Himself known to Israel. He makes Himself known to the whole world. <clears throat> Look, for example, Exodus 4, verse 22. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, Thus says the Lord. Israel is my son, my verse firstborn, so I said to you, let my son go. God sends Moses to tell Pharaoh, to tell Israel, to, to tell Israel as well, who he is, what he is going to do. <clears throat> what does this mean for us? It means, do not forget that when you hold the Bible in your hand, it's not just another book. The Bible is the Word of God. As we come to study the Bible tonight, it is these things that God has given to us whereby we are to know Him. Let us not neglect the reading of our Bible, the memorizing of our Bible. Let us treasure these things in our hearts like Psalm 119 says. Let us not neglect meditating in the Bible. Let us not neglect making the Bible the standard of our lives. This brings us to the narrower context we need to consider. The broader context is that God is the God of salvation and that He makes Himself known. The narrower context, as we consider what we're going to study tonight, um, if we consider the first part of the book of Exodus, is the satanic opposition of Pharaoh. We have seen this since chapter 1 of Exodus. Pharaoh is the force of evil, standing in total satanic opposition to God and, uh, by proxy, his people. We see this uh, over and over um, in, the, in, in Exodus. Look at the very first words out of Pharaoh's mouth in Exodus 5 verse 2. Who is the Lord that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know the Lord, and besides, I will not let Israel go. Pharaoh immediately, consistently, and directly opposes God. It comes out in every word Pharaoh speaks. Moses tells Pharaoh, let my people go, and Pharaoh's response is a direct contradiction. I will not let Israel go. <coughs> God says, let my people go that they may serve me. Pharaoh says, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, direct contradiction. The word serve and the word labor are, have the same kind of meaning. Pharaoh says, they will serve me, not God. Take note of how severely Pharaoh reacted, um, considering last week's sermon. Why does he take it so personally? He is clearly personally offended by the very notion that the Israelites would go. Why is this? Is this because he wants bricks so badly? No. It is because in this world, in Pharaoh's world, he is God. Pharaoh is the God of the Hebrews. He is offended by the very idea that there is another God who can tell him what to do. Pharaoh takes this very personally. And so Pharaoh persecutes the Israelites. He takes it out on them. And in doing this, he is shaking his fist at God, at this God who comes and treads in his domain. He is saying to the Israelites, where is your God now? And look at the Israelites' response in chapter 5, verse 15. Then the foremen of the sons of Israel came and they cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? Who do they cry out to? Do they cry out to God? No, they cry out to Pharaoh. 
They tell Pharaoh, why do you deal this way with what? Whose servants? Pharaoh's servants. And not that the word servants is not correct. It should be slave. They are coming to Pharaoh and acknowledging that they are his slaves. And how does Pharaoh respond? You are lazy, very lazy. Therefore, I say, let us go. And s- therefore, you say, let us go to sacrifice to the Lord. So now, go and work. When he says, go now and work, the word work here is related to slave. He is saying, go now and be good little slaves, like you say you are. This is. I want you to realize this is satanic. This is evil. This is an abnormal degree of wickedness. As an aside, isn't this how we are with our sin? We so love the sin that enslaves us. By sticking to our sin, we are doing exactly what the Israelites here are doing, crying out to Pharaoh. Have you ever responded to your hardships and the disappointments that you face in life by sinning? That's like crying out to Satan instead of to God. This is what the Israelites are doing here. On that note, the third bit of context we need to remember is that in this point in the book of Exodus is the lowest point for the Israelites. They have hit rock bottom. Back in chapter 4, verse 31, it seemed that the Israelites are with the plan. It says, the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord was concerned about the sons of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed low and worshipped. That is, until Pharaoh put his foot on their necks. By the time we get to the end of last week's sermon, the Israelites were on team Pharaoh and just wanted Moses to go back where he came from. It would have been better if his feet never darkened the ground on which they toil every day. Now, I mentioned these three bits of context in introduction for us to take note this evening. First, what's the larger context? God is the God of salvation. Second, what is the overarching context of the first part of the Exodus? It's the satanic opposition of Pharaoh against God. Third, what is the immediate context for our study tonight? In chapter 6, verse 10, the Israelites have hit rock bottom. They are despondent, they're defeated, and they blame Moses for everything that's happening. In verse 21, they say, May the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants, to put a sword in their hand to kill us. And so, we come to chapter 6. Chapter 6. Verse 10. It says, Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke to the Lord, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me. How will then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. So once again, where are we in Exodus? What's the context? Moses has spoken to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh responded by crushing the Israelites. The Israelites then get upset at Moses and don't listen to him anymore. Now, God tells Moses to go back to Pharaoh and to tell him again to let the sons of Israel go. Now ask yourself the question, considering this. Does Moses have faith at this point? No. Look at what Moses says. Israel isn't listening to me. Pharaoh isn't listening to me. I have a speech impediment. This is the same old excuse. Does it sound like Moses has faith in God's plan? Now at this point, let us examine ourselves. Let us put ourselves in Moses' shoes. Imagine God comes to you while you're tending the sheep. He tells you, of all people, go and tell Pharaoh who, by the way, has a God complex, to let his entire workforce go and to go worship some other God he's never heard of. What would you say? Then imagine you go, and what happens is exactly what anyone would expect. It goes very badly. Isn't this exactly what we say ourselves? This is what happens when we try and obey God in our own strength. Pay attention. This is what happens when we try and obey God in our own strength, we will become despondent. We'll say, I tried it, it didn't work. 
What is our expectation in this case? What did we expect was going to happen? We're willing to follow God as long as it works out for us. We're willing to obey as long as um, things go well for us. And that's what Moses is going through here. But really, what did he expect was going to happen? Did he think Pharaoh would just say, Oh my goodness, I better let these slaves go now. Really, what, the way Pharaoh reacted was exactly how you would expect. But it's worse than that because God has already told Moses this is exactly what is going to happen. For, for chapter 4, verse, verse uh, 21 um, uh, this is what he says. The Lord said to Moses, When you go back to Egypt, see that you perform bef before Pharaoh all the wonders which I have put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. In fact, at this point, Moses hasn't even performed any wonders yet. This is exactly what, what is to be expected. Clearly, Moses still has some refining to do. He still needs to have some growing to do. Clearly, Moses still needs to become the man who would lead Israel out of Egypt. Furthermore, um, Israel is not in the place where they are ready to come out of Egypt. This is, of course, because they're so upset at Moses and that they are really regarding Pharaoh as higher than God. We saw that earlier when they relate to Pharaoh the way that they should only be relating to God. They cry out to Pharaoh. They say, thus saith Pharaoh. I didn't even read that earlier. They, can't, they, they cry out to Pharaoh. Um, we see it right here in this passage. Then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh the king of Egypt to bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt. Do you notice? Israel and Pharaoh have been lumped together. What God is telling Moses here is that he is going to overcome Pharaoh and he is going to overcome Israel. And here, in these few words, massive theological worlds collide. This is who God is. This is how God reveals himself to the world. This is how God reveals himself to us. Fast forward many chapters, many weeks. Uh, Exodus 34, verse 6. Then the Lord passed by in front of Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of fathers on the children and the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. Here in Exodus 6, we see what God will do. He will overcome the Israelites. He will save them even though they are in no mood to be saved. He will save them not just from their slavery under Pharaoh, but from the one who is standing behind Pharaoh, the evil one. He will save them from their slavery to sin. Furthermore, God will overcome Pharaoh. He will utterly destroy him. He will crush Pharaoh with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. God will deliver his people and they will leave Egypt in ruins behind them. I thought I'd also read Exodus 34 verse 9. Moses said, If now you have found, if I have found favor in your sight, O Lord, I pray, let the Lord go along in our midst, even though the people are so obstinate, and pardon our iniquity and our sin, and take us as your possession. I read this because this is Moses' response to God in Exodus chapter 34. Is this the same Moses we have now? This is the point. Israel does not yet believe. Moses do not, does not yet believe. The change is a process, and this is the process that we're going to uh, witness in, in the coming weeks and, and months. This is the overarching reach of the Exodus. The Israelites not only need to leave Egypt, they need to leave their sin. The story of Exodus is not just how the Israelites are saved from their slavery to Pharaoh. It's the story of how the world is, slave, is saved from slavery to sin. You begin to see how massive the significance is of what is happening here. This is the story of the whole Bible. This is laying the groundwork for everything Jesus would come to accomplish. 
In the grand scheme of things, the physical exodus from Egypt is a small thing in comparison to the real exodus, the exodus from bondage under sin. There is so much that could be said about this, but it will have to suffice to say only this. What is it that Moses and the people of Israel don't understand? What are they missing? What are they lacking in understanding that causes them to respond in unbelief? This is important because we struggle with the exact same thing. What is it they don't understand that's keeping them from acting in faith and instead acting in unbelief and sin? This is it. What they do not understand is that God is sovereign over evil. You see, we have no problem attributing the good things that happen to, in our lives to God. If we get a promotion at work, you know, I'll be praying that night, God, thank you so much. You have remembered me. You have blessed me. Thank you that you've got my back. Do we pray like that when misery crosses our paths? Thank you, God, that I lost my job. Thank you, God, that my daughter is in a hospital. Thank you, God, that I am suffering under the heavy hand of Pharaoh. We don't respond like this, do we? This is because we do not realize that God is sovereign over evil, over the evil that we experience in our lives. The evil that happens in our lives is according to God's purposes. This doesn't mean that God is liable for evil. What it means is that nothing evil, nothing bad can happen that can thwart God's purposes. No plan of Satan can frustrate God's plans. It means all things work together according to God's pur- uh, it means all things work together for God's purposes. This is Romans 8 verse 28. It means that uh, what others mean for evil, God purposes for good. That's Genesis 50:20. I hope this helps you understand that the miseries we are so often forced to endure are not happening in spite of God's plans for us. They are God's plans for us. God is not inflicting suffering on us, but the evils we endure, God will use for His glory and for our good if we are His children. God will deliver the Israelites from bondage, but He will also overcome their hearts. This is the great story of the Gospel. And with that, we come to verse 14. From verse 14 to 24, we have a list of names. And at this point, you were wondering, why do we suddenly have a list of names? Why do we suddenly have a genealogy? And before I explain, let's, let's, read, let's, let's go through it. Let's read it together. I'll try and keep up. I've got multiple slides now. These are the heads of the fathers of their fathers' households, the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, Hanok and Palu, Hezron and Kamri. These are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jachin and Zohar and Shol, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. These are the names of the sons of Levi, according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merai, and the length of the Levi's life was 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni and Shemai, according to their families. The sons of Kohath, Amram and Izhar and Hebron and Uziel. The length of Kohath's life was 133 years. The sons of Merai, Mali and Mushi. These are the families of the Levites according to their generations. Amram married his father's sister Jochebed, and she bore him Aaron and Moses. And the length of Amram's life was 137 years. The sons of uh, Izhar, Korah, and Nephech, and Zikri. The sons of Uziel, Mishael, and el Zephar and Sithri. Now this, these are the sons of Kohath. So it's kind of coming in under the previous ones. Aaron married Elisheba, the daughter of Amminadab, the sister of Nachshon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Itamar, the sons of Korah, Asir and Elkanah, and Abiasaph. These are the families of the Korahites. Aaron's son, Eleazar, measured one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the fathers' households of the Levites, according to their families. 
It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the lands of Egypt according to their hosts. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the sons of Israel from Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. So, why is this here? Remember what we just talked about. (coughs) This geniality is at a pivotal point in Exodus. From here on, in Exodus, the focus of the book changes. And we'll see how shortly. But recall what we just talked about before this. It's relevant. We talked about a grand theological concept. The great things God will do. And the grand plan of salvation. And what do you know? That's why the genealogy is here. That's what's happening here. What this genealogy signifies is that God has a plan and purpose for these things that are taking place. What this is saying is that everything that has happened up to this point is laying the foundation of what comes next. Up to this point, nothing seems to be working. It has gone so far as to the point where Moses returns to God at the end of chapter 6 and says, Lord, why have you brought harm to these people? Why did you even send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in your name, he has done harm to his people, and you have not delivered your people at all. Note that this is this is this is what what we have at this at this point. We are at a low point, and I just want to point out also that the these was not these this chapter in Exodus, the book of Exodus, uh, and Genesis and the Pentateuch. They weren't written as these events took place. Uh, I just wanted thought I'd point that out. They were likely written while they were wandering in the desert. Uh, What I'm saying is that this genealogy was not written before these people were born. Um, This was written after these people were born. So um, what we're asking is why does Moses, inspired by the Holy Spirit, choose to include the genealogy here? And the reason is this. Nothing seems to be going according to plan. But then we come to uh, chapter 6 verse 14 and what do we see? There is a plan. There was always a plan. And see, this is not a random list of people. I wanted to show a nice picture, but the picture was going to be really complicated, so I'll just talk through it. What this shows us is the Levites, the priests. We see Aaron as the first high priest and his ancestry all the way back to Jacob, to Israel. We see the lineage of priests who will hold the mediatorial office. They will be mediators for the people. Why is this important now? Because we just saw that these people indeed really need a mediator. Now Moses will mediate before Pharaoh and Aaron and the priests who are his and his tribe's descendants. They will mediate before God for the people of Israel. So Aaron, so we see Aaron, we see Eleazar, we see the son of Aaron, who will, we, we will read about him many, many times later in the Bible. We see Phineas, who will also be mentioned many times later. We see Korah, who will be mentioned again, though not in a good way. We'll see. And then we see Moses listed, but not any of his descendants. Why is that? This is because prophets, unlike priests, are not chosen according to their tribe. Moses is the first capital P prophet. The one who speaks the word of God to the people. So, we have the office of priests. We have the office of prophet. Do we have anything else? Interestingly, we do. Notice... Uh, do you see what it says about Aaron? It says, Aaron married Elisheba, El- El- the daughter of Aminadab, the sister of Nashon. It kind of mentions these side people. Why does it mention these extra people? I'm going to read from a different part of the Bible and see if you can figure it out. Now, these are the generations of Perez. Perez was, to Perez was born Hezron. To Hezron was born Ram. And to Ram was born Aminadab. And to Aminadab was born Nachshon, and to Nachshon Salmon, and to Salmon was born Boaz, and to Boaz Obed, and to Obed was born Jesse, and to Jesse David. And there we have it. The office of the king. Do you see why this all is mentioned here in the middle of nowhere in Exodus? 
Well, it's not in the middle of nowhere, but it seems like it's in the middle of nowhere. It's as if the writer knows the reader will say to himself, well, things have certainly gone awry now. And then God comes and says, here's a glimpse. Here's a hint of what is to come. This is all part of a plan. What plan? The plan. The big plan. The plan that is first mentioned in Genesis 3. And we won't see these things come to fruition until over a thousand years later. But when Jesus comes, whose ancestors are also mentioned here in Exodus 6, we will see these three offices come together. And in Christ we will see the office of prophet, priest and king come together. And again we will see God pull back the curtain and say, at the lowest point in all of history, when Jesus is hanging on the cross, this is all part of the plan. So this is what is happening here. God is pulling back the curtain and he's showing us uh, a part of the plan that is yet to come. And why here? Because here, first of all, this is the lowest point. This is the point where Israel and Moses and everybody is most despondent. But also because here the focus shifts. Here we are changing gears. It has been uphill until here, but now we have come to the crest of the hill, and it's downhill from here. From here on, things are going to get moving. And this brings us to the next point. Um, God will stretch out his hand. Uh, the next verse says, uh, the, the, the genealogy part ends with this. It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt according to their hosts. It's as if we are being reminded that these two men, Moses and Aaron, are small cogs in a big machine. They are part of the big plan. We have seen a bit of what Moses is going through here. Uh, he repeatedly doesn't want to go. He doesn't believe that it will work. He keeps complaining that he cannot talk. And God keeps reminding him, of what he will do. It's as if the Bible is saying, yes, these two guys, they are the guys. You're not reading it wrong. It is actually these two guys who are a part of the plan. And then we see uh, what at first seems like a repetition of what we've read already. Uh, I'll read it all and then we'll refer back to it. Remember, we just crested a hill. The chapter is turning on a hinge. Uh, there is symmetry in the things we are reading, but the focus is now different. Uh, let's read. Now it came about on the day that the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord, speak to Pharaoh the king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said before the Lord, behold, I am unskilled in speech, how will the Pharaoh then listen to me? Uh, then the Lord said to Moses, See, I make you as God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. You shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall speak to Pharaoh, that he let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart that I may multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt, and I will bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. So Moses and Aaron did it. As the Lord commanded them, thus they did. Moses was 80 years old and Aaron was 83 when they spoke to Pharaoh. Sorry, I... Here at the very end, at verse 7, we see it mentioned that Moses was 80 and that Aaron was 83. This binds together, this, this pulls us back to what we read at the end of the ge genealogy, that God is using these decrepit old men uh, to lay the foundations of God's purpose for the rest of history. In other words, don't be fooled by their appearances. God's plan will come to fruition. Then let's go back to the end of chapter 6. I want to see if you notice the change of direction here. Remember that the focus is now changed. I said that, but I didn't explain how. And this is how. Before the genealogy in chapter 6, uh, the focus was on Israel. We saw Moses and Aaron before wonders, before the Israelites. We saw the faith of the Israelites. Then we saw Pharaoh down, bear down upon them, and their faith fail. And then we saw that even Moses was struggling to understand how all these calamities were a part of God's plan.
Then we saw the curtain pulled back. We saw a glimpse of God's great plan. And then the focus shifts. The focus is no longer on Israel. It is now on Pharaoh. We see this in verse 29. I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. Israel and Egypt are no longer lumped together. In fact, Israel will not be mentioned again until Exodus 9. The focus is now on Pharaoh. We have seen up to this point that Pharaoh has crushed Israel. He has bared down upon them. He has increased their labor. We saw how he has satanically opposed God and what he commanded, but no more. From here on out, God will systematically demolish Pharaoh. Pharaoh will be crushed, and at the end, just as God promised, under compulsion, the Israelites will leave. We see something else in verse 3. God says, But I will harden Pharaoh's heart. What is very interesting is that this word harden here is different from the word he used in chapter 4. In chapter 4, 21, God says, But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. The word harden is different. The earlier use meant something along the lines of strengthen, to grow firm, to be strong. And the latter use, the use here, is more along the lines to, be, to stiffen, to make stubborn or defiant. It's a change of tone from a more positive, charitable attribution to a more negative, derisive tone. This is uh, the turn of how Pharaoh is being portrayed from being the strong man who rules with an iron fist to the stubborn bully who in the face of overwhelming might refuses to surrender an obviously lost cause. Now, this may be, seem an obscure point to make, but this is the change that must happen in our hearts as well. Uh, consider the situation has not changed. Nothing has happened uh, since uh, before chapter 6, verse 27. I want to encourage you that when your situation seems helpless, when you are struggling and the trouble in your life seems insurmountable, remind yourself of the promises of God. A different perspective can make all the difference in the world. And how must our perspective be different? We must have God's perspective. This is the purpose of the genealogy in Exodus 6, 14 to 27. God has a different perspective. He sees the end from the beginning. He is sovereign over everything in the world. He is sovereign even over evil. Remember Romans 28, that God works together all things for those who are called according to his purpose. When you are tempted, remember 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that you will never be tempted beyond what you're able to bear. When you're facing loss, heartache, calamity, and the miseries we are sometimes forced to endure, remember 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17 to 18. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. Remember the eventual result of our final exodus. In Revelation 21, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. So from here on, the perspective, the focus, the tone has changed. From here on, God will crush Pharaoh. Pharaoh will continue in his satanic opposition to God and persist in his wickedness. But God will destroy him. Uh, look at 7 verse 2. Sorry, that's what up here. You shall speak to Pharaoh that he let, this, let the sons of Israel go out of his land. <clears throat> Whose land? Pharaoh's land. God says, I will take what you think is yours out of your land. God says he will humble Pharaoh in his own land, in his own house. We have already spoken about verse 3, so look at verse 4. When Pharaoh does not listen to you, then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring out my hosts, my people, the sons of Israel, from the land of Egypt by great judgments. God says he will bring out his hosts. This word means armies or armed forces. And it's clear he is referring to the Israelites. What God is saying is that these people, Pharaoh, are so desperate to keep, will ultimately be the force that overcomes him. They shall be as an enemy's armed forces to him, even though they are a nation of slaves. They will lead, e leave Egypt with the spoils of war, without ever having picked up a weapon. 
Verse 5, the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand on Egypt and I bring out the sons of Israel from their midst. Remember we talked earlier about the great context of the book of Exodus. God revealing himself, who he is. Here the focus is the Egyptians. They will know God is the Lord of Lords when Pharaoh is crushed and God accomplishes what he said he would. Then look at what God says. I will stretch out my hand. This is personal. God will reveal himself to Pharaoh and the Egyptians. He will show them who he is. And what will they see? They will see his outstretched arm. They will see Hebrews 12 verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. They will see Hebrews 10:31. It is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Do we consider God like this? Do we realize this is the God we worship? There are only two ways we can respond to God. There are only two ways we can get to know God. Either we submit to Him in worship, and we know God's mercy and grace and forgiveness of sins, and His loving kindness extended to thousands, or we will harden our heart like Pharaoh, and we will get to know God as a consuming fire, the God who does not leave wickedness unpunished, the God who does not leave his enemies undestroyed. Is your heart hard or soft? How do you respond to the truth of God? Are you hanging on to your sin like Pharaoh is hanging on to his brickmakers? I plead with you, call out to the Lord while he may be found lest he falls upon you like he did to Pharaoh. Now let's move on to our last part of the text today. I called it Face Off in Pharaoh's Palace. <clears throat> like that. So Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh a second time. <laughs> this time they are not asking, they are telling. So what follows from verse 8 to 14 sets the stage for what's to come. And I think it's like the, those meetings they have before boxing matches, like this. Who do you think is going to win? <laughs> Where the two boxers face off and they, they kind of size each other up and they try and intimidate each other. But it's not time for the fight just yet. Uh, verse 8, chapter 7, verse 8. Now the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When Pharaoh speaks to you, saying, Work a miracle, then you shall say to Aaron, Take your staff and throw it before Pharaoh, that it may become a serpent. So Moses and Aaron came to Pharaoh, and thus they did just as the Lord had commanded. And Aaron threw his staff down before Pharaoh and his servants, and it became a serpent. We've seen this before, we, haven't we, in, in chapter 4. There God told Moses to throw his staff on the floor on the ground, and he turned into a snake. Do you remember what Moses did? Does anybody remember what he did? He ran away, <laughs> yes. In Moses' defense, God didn't tell him what would happen. <laughs> he just told Moses to throw his staff on the ground, and then he turned into a snake. <laughs> I'm sure I would have run away as well. But we don't quite have the same situation here. Previously, it was to show Moses God's power, to show Moses who God is. But now the focus is Pharaoh. So why? Why a snake? First off, does it say snake? It says serpent. What, um, what, the word, uh, sorry, I lost my place. Um, it says serpent. Why is it significant? The same word for serpent is used elsewhere in the Bible. For example, Job 7 verse 12, where Job says, Am I the sea or the sea monster that you set a guard over me? Now, we know that, snake, that it means snake here in Exodus. It doesn't mean sea monster. Um, but the word is used here on purpose. The word used here has supernatural connotations. Aaron's staff turning into a snake here shows God's power over the natural world. Furthermore, this word serpent here has a telling translation in other places. And let's look at Isaiah 51 verse 9. 
Awake, awake, put on strength, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, the generations of long ago. Was it not you who cut Rahab to pieces, who pierced the dragon? So what's happening here? God is showing his ultimate power over the natural and the supernatural. Specifically, the ultimate enemy, the great serpent. Satan. Once again, we see echoes of God's purposes in the world. He will defeat Pharaoh now and utterly destroy him. But Satan likewise will ultimately face his own destruction. So God here, by turning the staff into a monster, into a snake, shows he has power over the natural world and he has power over the supernatural. He has power over the so-called gods of Egypt. He has power over the unseen forces of evil. He has power over wickedness. He has power over Pharaoh. He has power over Satan himself. There is no contest. Look at what happens next. Then Pharaoh also called for the wise men and the sorcerers. And they also, the magicians of Egypt, did the same with their secret arts. For each one threw his staff and they turned into serpents. But Aaron's staff swallowed up their staffs. So, Pharaoh's lackeys can also conjure up serpents. Now, look at the wording. Uh, these are the so-called wise men, the sorcerers, the magicians of Egypt. They do the same thing with their so-called secret arts. By some hidden magics and some secret techniques, they manage to conjure serpents. Now, the immediate question we have is, were their snakes real? And the very fact that we're asking this question kind of already gives an answer. So let's look at the wording and ask ourselves a few more questions. So, these are the sorcerers and magicians of Egypt. Is Aaron a magician? No. We don't even wonder about that. And why? Because Aaron didn't change the staff into a snake. It was God. Secondly, they did this by their secret arts. What are their secret arts? We don't know their secret. <laughs> uh, did God change this, the, the staff into a snake by secret arts? No. Nothing is hidden here. Aaron's staff simply is changed into a snake. One second it was a staff made out of wood, and the next second it was no longer a staff. It was a snake made out of snake. <laughs> Later it would once again become a wooden staff. So as you can see, the fact that so many words are being used to explain uh, how these Egyptians managed to change their stars into snakes shows that it is fake. It's trickery, it's deception, it's not real. And even if we were to take it literally and consider that they somehow transmuted a stick into a snake using some demonic power we don't know about, it's still not real. And then verse 12 ends with... But Aaron's uh, staff swallowed up their staffs. I appreciate the wording staffs. It's, it shows the absurdity of what's happening. Aaron's stick ate the Egyptian sticks. This again is a sign of what's to come. See, Aaron's snake didn't just bite the other snakes. He didn't just fight the other snakes and kill the other snakes. He swallowed the other snakes. He ate the other snakes. And I'm, I must admit, I keep thinking, then it turned back into a staff. So all those snakes in there somehow. <laughs> Please forgive me. It's just, it is just so crazy what's happening. But what this shows us is that God is going to completely overwhelm Pharaoh. It's not a contest. This is going to be a one-sided fight. Can you imagine if you are one of these so-called magicians and you later come to your magician friends and they ask you, where's your staff? And you have to say, the other guy's staff ate my staff. Now, who, ask yourself, who won that fight? It's like, you stand there and all of Pharaoh's magicians don't have staffs. This is, this is it, it's, I know, I, I'm not trying to make light of it. It really is absurd what's happening. And the point is this. It is absurd to contest with God in this situation. Uh, this is the significance of what is happening. The other snakes weren't real. And even if they were, it wasn't a symbol of real power. It was an illusion. It was secret arts. Something that, if exposed, is shown to be false. And this is a metaphor for Pharaoh's power. 
It's not real. It's an illusion. When confronted with real power, with God's power, it is not just, you won't just be wounded, you will be obliterated, never to be seen or heard from again. Um, yet, the passage concludes, Yet Pharaoh's heart was hardened, and he doth not listen to them as the Lord had said. Just like God said, Pharaoh does not listen. He is unfazed even after being confronted by true power. In the next few chapters, we will see Pharaoh being broken down, piece by piece, until he is finally destroyed, swallowed, just as these serpents by the Red Sea, never to be seen or heard from again. Consider the evils you face in your life. What persecutions do you have to endure? Perhaps you are being ridiculed by someone because of your faith. Perhaps you are being overlooked at work because you are a Christian. Remind yourself of this. Satan's power is not real. He does not have real power. God has real power. If you are a believer, everything you face is a part of God's plan. Consider the other side of the coin. Perhaps you are struggling with temptation. Perhaps you are being tempted to sin and time and time again you succumb to your sinful tendencies. Remember, if you are a believer, this power has been broken. It is not real. It is the illusion of power. Second Peter 2 verse 9 says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Which brings me to the final point of application. If you are an enemy of God, your judgment is sure. There is no two ways about it. God will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. Do not make the mistake that Pharaoh is making here. First, he did not believe that God was real. He was his own God and then he took it so personally when Moses came before him and told him of this other God. Are you personally offended by some of the things that are said from this pulpit? Remember Pharaoh. Even after he was shown a sign of a supernatural wonder, he did not believe. He hardened his heart. He made his neck stiff. But like steel that has been tempered, his strength was nothing but brittleness. And in the end he was shattered, completely destroyed. Such will be the fate of those whose sin will be counted against them on the day of judgment. In conclusion, what did we look at today? We saw that the book of Exodus turns on a hinge at this point. Before chapter 7, the focus was on Israel and now Pharaoh, and Pharaoh, how Pharaoh tries to crush them. The second half of the chapter, uh, of chapter 6, we see God peel back the curtain and show us the things which are yet to come to pass. The line of priests, prophets, and even hints of an eventual king. This reminding us that even though everything seems to have gone completely wrong until now, God is sovereign. He is sovereign over evil, even the evil in Pharaoh's heart. Everything that has transpired up till now is a part of the great plan of salvation. The great overarching message of the Bible, that God is the Lord of Lords who keeps his loving kindness for thousands, yet by no means leaves the guilty unpunished. Then in chapter 7, we saw the focus shift from Israel to Pharaoh, we see the face off in Pharaoh's palace, where Aaron's staff turns into a serpent that gobbles up the fake serpents of Pharaoh's magicians. And yet, after all this, Pharaoh is unfazed. He's unperturbed and stubborn as always, setting the stage for his spectacular and resounding defeat, resulting in the exodus of Israel from Egypt to the Promised Land. Finally, I'll remind you that in each of these points, we, we looked and saw that these are not just things, historical tidbits for us to study. This is a part of God revealing himself to us. This is God's character. These things are not just pieces of ancient histories. They are glimpses of how God deals with his people. And since we call ourselves his children, these things show us how we are meant to think about God and about life. And with that, uh, let me pray for us. <clears throat> Father, you are the God of gods, the Lord of lords. 
and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, you deliver your people. We will see as we study the book of Exodus, how you will deliver the Israelites from their bondage uh, under Pharaoh with great wonders and majesty and power. But Father, behind it, we see your purposes. We see the great Exodus. We see the great enemy and his defeat. And so, Father, we pray that your name would be glorified as um, you work in us to overcome the sin in our hearts, to move us out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of your beloved Son. And, Father, as we look forward to his return, and the eventual destruction of the evil one as this Pharaoh has been destroyed. We pray that as we endeavor to be obedient, to be faithful, that you would protect us from the evil one, that you would help us, that you would work in us um, as we look